Today is Tuesday, January 17th, 2023. This is a meeting with the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. We are uh, following up on our earlier work to introduce staff and one of the other people this committee works with a great deal is um, Mr. O'Grady. So Mr. O'Grady, if you could join us at the table, I introduce yourself, tell us what you cover, and we'll try to get Okay. Good morning. My name is Michael O'Grady. I'm the Deputy Chief Counsel for the Office of Legislative Council, and I've been staffing this committee for 20 years. <laughs> um, with me today is Ashley Angel. She's a law clerk that's working with Tucker Anderson and I this session, similar to previous law clerks that uh, I'm sure so many of you recall. So I'm going to hand out a document. I don't know if you want me to go through it or not. It basically is a short summary of the, the subject matter I uh, stacked for this committee. Yes. As you know, we're doing S5 right now. I, but we will be coming back to seven. So, so, so what is on? the document underneath the general subject matter some of the, the more pressing issues that either arose last year at Flanium um, or are kind of perennial issues and uh, I just wanted to I can just quickly go through sure. those if you would like yeah just wait. so waste management uh, is something that uh, I work on a lot I don't consider myself a solid waste expert because there are the people that I call the solidly superstars that are really the experts, yeah. um, Matt and Josh at the agency, Jen Holiday at Solid Waste, John Letty at Northwest Solid Waste, Kim and Casella. Um, they're really the experts, and I just help them and you um, manage the solid waste issues. The bottle bill was a big issue last year. It passed both houses but in substantially different forms uh, the big difference was in the senate an extended producer responsibility program was added extended producer responsibility is when the legislature requires manufacturers or distributors to take on the financial and management responsibility for collection of discarded products uh, vermont has several of those product of those programs um, and the proposal last year was effectively to expand the bottle bill, which is an EPR program, into a more traditionally looking EPR program. What is EPR? Extended producer responsibility. Oh, okay. You might also uh, hear it referred to as product stewardship. Mm -hmm. um, and before I quick interruption, I meant to say this before we started. Here is scheduled. At some point today, who knows when, a fire drill, uh, sort of evacuation. So I wanted to just make sure before that happens, if that happens for committee members, we grab your coats, whatever, we face it to the east and gather the parking lot and check in with June so she can do a head count on all of us. Other people in the room will march out probably in kind of the same way. Uh, I think we aim for that uh, the small upper lot that's you know walk out the door 200 mm -hmm. feet away yes. in that upper part. Okay, sorry for the interruption. So another issue I'm sure you've many of you've heard of is the landfill uh, and the concerns about uh, its management and leachate from it uh, and the advocates that are. Uh, trying to coalesce around doing something about it. Uh, so I think you'll probably hear from advocates on that issue in your session as you did last year. Another bill. Isn't there a rulemaking or permit right that's going on? Permit, permit, permit right. Yeah. Uh, and then the agency is requiring some pilot programs for each control at the landfill. An issue that's been kicking around for a couple of years is a household hazardous products extended producer responsibility program. So think, you know, your toilet cleaner, your um, the bleak, 
search or or discarded ink thinner? Like, what do you do with those things? Technically, you're supposed to take them to your solid waste management entity's collection site or collection event. That costs those solid waste management monies in your municipality a lot of money. Um, so one of the concepts is to require those manufacturers and distributors to set up EPR for those products and relieve the municipalities of those costs. Um, there is a draft household hazardous waste bill. So almost ready for introduction before I introduce it. I'll circulate it for the committee. I'm going to skip over the number of the double number three on this, but um one of the things that you usually hear about, and it's it's not much of an issue usually is the petroleum cleanup fund. Uh, but that fund needs to be reauthorized and the and the expenditures from it reauthorized every couple of years. Um, so you'll you generally hear about that and it's, it's fairly it's fairly non-controversial. What is controversial right now are um, per floral or polyfluoral alcohol substances, PCOS. Um, they are referred to as forever chemicals. They are chemicals that are literally everywhere right now. They're in the soil, they're in the water, groundwater. Um, they were um, either not properly managed or not properly disposed of or not properly combusted in their use. Um, and either, and they were, their forever nature was not properly understood. So they are in carpets. They're in sneakers, they're in Gore Tex, they're in non stick pans, they're in many, many, many things. And they're in us. And they're likely <laughs> in every one of us, in our blood and our tissue. Um, and uh, the, there's been a real effort at both the federal and state level to try to manage. Prefox, US EPA has something called a strategic roadmap. Um, and they have been doing good work on that. They came out with their report card on their roadmap in December. It includes things like designating certain chemicals as hazardous waste. So if it is found in soil, um, it, it triggers CERCLA, it triggers Superfund, and the need to manage that, that land as a, as a Superfund site. Um, it's going to include drinking water standards. It's going to include surface water standards. Um, but there are advocates in the state who want to go further than what the strategic roadmap is proposing. Things in the state can be more stringent. And um, there's, there's potential for that. So, of course, could you just clarify the, <clears throat> the relationship of state efforts in this regard? with federal efforts. And when you're done with that, how this committee relates to the health and welfare committee. Well, the sure. should have Sure. So let me answer that second question first. Um, I step the toxic substances, in this case PFOS, when it relates to them in the environment, in media, in water, air, soil, etc. Maybe in your school. Um, but Katie McClinn and the um, health and welfare staff said when it's in a product, what's in it's in a consumer product that's going to potentially affect the health and welfare. I get it when it's already out there. She gets it to try to prevent it from getting out there. So who's dealing with manufacturer responsibility? Which is the moment at which it gets there? It, it, usually that depends on the, the product at that, that issue. Food service where which you did last year. That was key. Uh, drinking water standards, which the state did several years ago, that was me. And so states, most states, I should say, implement the federal laws. They implement the Clean Water Act, they implement the Safe Drinking Water Act, they implement the Recreate the Resource Conservation Recovery Act. And most states have their own state super fund. And that they work in conjunction with, with EPA. Most of those programs have to meet the minimum federal standards. If they can go further than that. 
So you can have a more stringent state program uh, than what the Fed set as the war. Unless there's a specific preemption clause, and most of those media programs don't have a preemption clause. So the states can be more strict than the Feds. Is it possible? Thank you for letting me take some more time. Getting back to again, this committee on health and welfare. Is it possible for there to be a jurisdictional gap that a manufacturer can fall into? What I'm thinking is if we want to deal with waste, probably we ought to be reaching back to before it becomes waste. And, and what is the perhaps even responsibility at the time of sale? For example, as they took from the Scandinavian country, when, when the manufacturer sells the product, part of the price is money to deal with it when it becomes waste. So, so like, that's what extended producer responsibility yeah. is about. We don't do it in the Scandinavian model where you charge for that when the product is sold. It's okay. We do for paint, but but that 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 that's that's the Scandinavian model. We follow the German model, and the German model is just like, hey, manufacturer, you just do it, right? <laughs> and you assume the cost for it, and you provide the collection sites, and and you do the education. And if you need to charge more for your product to pay for it, well, then go ahead, charge more for the product, but. You're going to be in a com competitive marketplace, and that will be up to you. But you still have to do the, the EPR program. So, who had, which legislative committee has jurisdiction over that kind of a, an initiative? I, I think that would probably be a decision of the pro tem <laughs> about where he would want to send that. I think you could send it to this committee. I think you could send it to the other committee. Or either. It could happen that no one addresses that issue of manufacturer responsibility. Well, if the bill is introduced, it has to be referred to the committee. Yeah. Right. So then it's up to the other committees to take it up or not. You might be looking to an existing bill. Sure. Maybe they need them. You know, and, and there are states that have gone forward already. Maine has has already put in a general generally applicable PFOS ban, except when there's a determination by the relevant party that it's necessary. Um, don't really you know how they're gonna enforce that. Yeah, that's uh, but that's there. So uh, we've a lot of other thoughts in over the years. It's, there, it's an opportunity. I think there's a need and an opportunity so to spend a lot more time kind of getting it on. So the other the other big toxic substance issue that I will likely staff this session is funding for PCB testing in schools. Um, PCBs are a toxic substance that was commonly used in building materials prior to 1980 when they were banned. Uh, they break down. Uh, they can become uh, basically particulate in, in the air. They can also contaminate water and groundwater. Most schools in Vermont were built prior to 1980. So most schools in Vermont have a potential for PCB materials in the building materials and then for off-gassing a particulate from PCB. Uh, and people, the Agency of Natural Resources is implementing, implementing a program to test schools for that. The question will be for mediation, what will be the steps? What will be required? What will be the thresholds for the different required mediations? So that's something we have to talk to ANR about. They have a general proposal and they have a funding request in both the BAA and they assume the ultimate budget. So, 
Moving on from there, water quality. I expect water quality kind of quiet because it was so loud for so long. Um, you finally have the TMDLs implemented. EPA has approved everything. You've got a funding mechanism. EPA approved the funding mechanism. You have the statewide water quality initiative. You have the clean water service providers as required by rule. You have the local implementation. You have the Agency of Agriculture doing its ag water quality financing. You've got the system set up. Know what else there is to do except maybe a PFAS water quality standard. You've already got that requirement in statute. It's due in 2024. Um, when you look at the funding of the Clean Water Fund, do you oversee that at all? Or would that be, is there someone at JFO that looks at that? I drafted the language that, that pushed the revenue sources into the Clean Water Fund, but JFO is really the one that manages how much is in there and, and what's it ultimately approved. And do we typically get like a report out from them on how it's doing or the need to be allocating more revenue? The Clean Water Board publishes the Clean Water Investment Report every year, which gives, it's I would say a higher level view. It's, it's got a lot of graphics in it. They like really graphic heavy and like pretty for a while and not as in depth as they could have gone. Okay. Um, but it's it's a good resource, and then there are multiple per, uh, reports that ANR produces, required by the Federal Clean Water Act, about the state status and water quality. There's a 303D report. There's the state water quality assessment. There's the stress waters. So there's there's many. They have a very good website that kind of combines all of those, consolidates all of those resources. Don't we get that? Well, I've seen it yet, but every January 15th, I thought we had a clean water initiative report. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of tied up with the clean water investment report, and you should you should get that. I think agencies had asked for instead of delivering it yesterday to deliver it today. Oh. And it's usually helpful. And of course, it's a good starting point for conversations. Uh, the other things, water quality issues I staff are wetlands, aquatic use and species, and riparian protection. There's a conversation going on about all of those right now. I don't want to that about them, but there's a wetland pool that's coming down. Um, there's conversation about whether or not the state needs more direction on wetlands mitigation uh, for riparian protection. You passed a bill almost 10 years ago that. Um, brought the state into compliance with FEMA's emergency management requirements, and then gave states the ability to adopt what is called fluvial erosion hazard mapping to like, go further than the FEMA minimums. Uh, most municipalities didn't do fluvial erosion hazard mapping, and there's conversations about whether or not that, that should be mandatory. Just the option that a use is control. You hear about it all the time. The committee's done work on it before, whether or not it's the go washing or the grant program. Um, issues like that. One of, one of the issues is the use of, of herbicides. Uh, that kind of came to the core the last couple of years, a couple of larger towns, larger lakes wanted to use herbicides and there was Iroquois bouncy. So there's been some opposition to the use of herbicides and lakes. I also do forestry last year. He did the enrollment of reserve forest land and use value. I don't see much else coming unless the department comes forward with another initiative like they did about 10 years ago. I think we'll see the 30 by 30, 50 by 50. Right. And then I do fish and wildlife. Uh, the two big issues that are out there right now are um, the ban on the moratorium on 
hunting coyote with dogs until the Fish and Wildlife Board adopts rules consistent with the legislative directive. Uh, from my knowledge, they haven't done much on the, the, the coyote rule, so the moratorium remains in place until those rules are adopted. And then the second is trapping. Last year, there was a bill directing the Fish and Wildlife Board to adopt best management practices for trapping. Uh, the agency had a draft out in December, late December. I don't know if it's finalized yet, um, but it is doing what you effectively directed of following the, the National Wildlife Commissioner's recommendations on best management practices with some, you know, variation. Uh, you should probably talk to Kim Breyer at the department, right? Her and she's been the one that's been needing that for the board, for the department. And those are those are the fish and wildlife issues. Thank you. Um, yeah, each one of these things we have a, a real conversation about. So it's interesting how many things end up coming through eventually over time. And as you can tell from the conversation, none of them get solved. We make a dent on things. There's almost no room for improvement. You also will likely get miscellaneous subject bills from, from both the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Environmental Conservation. Parks and Parks. Parks and Parks doesn't like to be here. <laughs> Gotta be in the woods. <laughs> So, um, thank you. Right, there is a thing you know, I'm drafting now of the facilities, what the house we can build that BBC requested. And so, I passed that along to Mr. Brady in the last couple of months, whatever. But, so, we'll see that. But, to the editing, not, not immediately, right? We're the editors are a little back up right now. but. That you'll see it. We're all heat all the time right now. <coughs> we have, we'll be we're patient. Okay, uh, any questions for Mr. O'Grady? Good to see you. Thank you very much. Again. So, one of the great things about that is how long they've working. Of this. And he's been staffing this committee for 20 years. It's a great resource when it comes to. So if you have, if you're thinking about a bill or issue or just want explanations like these, very helpful. With that, we're changing gears back to following um, our all heat all the time and in the form of. Hearing about what's been going on with uh, action plan. So, good morning, Ms. Lodorchin. How are you? Chair Bray. Um, I'm great, thank you. Nice to see you again. Yeah. Yeah. So, no surprise, we're curious about what's been going on as a council and with the kind of action plan. Um, and thank you for the report. For something the last week was very important. So morning everyone, I'm Jane Zorchek. I am the director most recently now of the newly formed Climate Action Office within the Agency of Natural Resources. I've worked at the Agency of Natural Resources for 17 years. Uh, almost 15 years of that was actually doing public land management and land acquisition in the Fish and Wildlife Department. So been in the secretary's office now for just over two years. Um, I have a presentation this morning. Um, my presentation will sort of focus in and out of both the Climate Council work and the work of the Climate Action Office. I will give you a brief update and understanding that there are new senators to this committee um, on the GWSA and the Climate Action Plan itself, but then I'd like to really shift and talk about implementation and the work that we've been doing over the last year. Um, it's about 15 slides, but really encourage you if you'd like to pause at any time along the way. I'm happy to take questions as I talk. Um, do you, could you enable um, screen sharing? Oh, sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's been great. Now we have. Okay, you should be able to. Thanks for being here. Yes. Is 
So I did send along the presentation. It looks like you have it. I also sent along the legislative report. And as you can imagine, as we're standing up the Climate Action Office, the work of the Climate Action Office is really in service to implementing the Climate Action Plan. But I'll try to sort of uh, touch along the way of like specific Climate Council direction and initiatives, and then independent work of state government to um, stand up the work of the Climate Action Plan. So um, I believe many of you are probably familiar with this, but the Global Warming Solutions Act was passed obviously just over two years ago in September of 2020. Um, and the first meeting of the Climate Council was just about six weeks after. Um, the Climate Council itself is an independent body, uh, 23 members, 15 members appointed by the legislature, um, eight House appointed members, seven Senate appointed members, and eight administration officials sit on the Climate Council. Um, it represents various sectors and private areas of work that have a say in both climate action and climate solutions. Um, the work um, really began in earnest to stand up the climate action plan when the subcommittees were stood up a few short months later. There were four subcommittees written into the law um, and the discretion was provided to the Climate Council to stand up any additional committees needed to do the work of the climate action plan and the work of the GWSA more broadly. Um, those subcommittees are the Just Transition Subcommittee, Cross-Sector Mitigation, Rural Resilience and Adaptation, uh, Science and Data, and the Ag and Ecosystems Subcommittee. I really mention all of them because it was really the work of standing those committees up that brought in really a wide array of Vermonters to help in think about the technical solutions and um, approach needed to stand up our climate action plan. Um, the fact that we were able to adopt it in just over 13 short months is really nothing short of a miracle, it feels like sometimes. Um, it was a really ambitious endeavor and um, the GWSA required not only a plan of what, but really a focus of how we were going to operationalize and move forward with climate action. I'd like to highlight that because other states have stood up climate action plans on similar timelines, but they really don't focus on the sort of day to day. And so as we get into this plan, it really focuses on the broad strokes, buckets of work that we need to do, but sort of the role of state government and the role of our partners across the state and how to get there. This work is ongoing. Uh, the first plan um, is over a year old now. And actually um, the second sort of update to that plan is actually required in three and a half years, not the four years. The um, next plan will be due July 1st. We shift to a July 1st timeline of 2025. Um, and so we're really looking at what that ongoing work is and the phases in between of this first plan and future iterations of it. The legislature working with the governor last year went um, a step farther and recognized one of the primary recommendations within the climate action plan was the need for an intergovernmental structure to advance climate action. Um, I, I don't always know if ANR was really always the right place. We have just a, a small component of all of climate action. It really is going to be a collaborative effort with Agency of Transportation, Ag, um, Public Service Department. But really, the rubber meets the road with the GWSA within ANR. That regulatory hook, if you don't meet the emissions reductions requirements, is on ANR. And so, and, and there's a great model that you're just hearing about with clean water and elsewhere to think about how we reach out and collaborate across state government in an efficient way to move the needle. Um, and so this past year, with an additional support in the base budget, um, we were able to staff up in the secretary's office and think about um, the positions needed to advance not only the climate action plan and the requirements within, but also to think about the components of the GWSA that we've not made enough progress on yet. I shouldn't say enough, but are still working to implement with respect to how we're going to measure and track progress going forward and these smaller components of the GWSA that we're working towards now that I'll speak to throughout the presentation today. Oh, quick question. So uh, staffing up in so the office is created, you're directing it. Um, how, how big is your office? And did we create that as full-time ongoing positions? Yes, mm -hmm. I'll be able to speak to that in a minute. Okay. Uh, I do just want to say acknowledging, and I've heard this in, even in speaking with other legislators in testimony over the last week, 
there's a significant component of working with the public that kind of carries through in the work of the EJ bill. Um, and it's really fortuitous that the EJ office and the Climate Action Office are being stood up simultaneously within the Secretary's office. And we're thinking a lot about sort of how we cement and really work together to bring forward um, voices into this conversation that have not traditionally been there and what the tools are needed. Um, I'll be able to speak to some of the work we did over this last year to do that, but we have so much further to go in building those relationships and the trust with Vermonters because the um, requirements of the GWSA require nothing short of sort of a whole scale shift on how we live on the landscape. And if Vermonters are not part of those ideas and solutions, then we're never going to be successful. As part of the Climate Action Office, we've stood up an interagency advisory board. I kind of joke that we want it to be like the EJ law because the EJ law has a advisory council and also has a state government body to coordinate on. And now the Climate Action Office has something very similar with working closely with the Climate Council, which is really advisory, includes outside voices. And now we have an interagency advisory board with the agencies listed on in the box on the right that is meeting regularly to think about how we stand up, communicate with one voice around state climate action, um, and think about um, the roles and responsibilities of cross government in order to address the issues um, at hand. And so this has been really um, an exciting time developed a charter for the Interagency Advisory Board, thinking about how we coordinate regularly on legislative issues um, and more through legislative check-ins and beyond. And so it's, it's really exciting to see government come together and think about how we do this um, in a coordinated fashion and what the added capacity is that the Climate Action Office can provide to support other state agencies in lifting up climate action in their space. We're doing that now with respect to thinking about outreach and engagement on the renewable energy standard with PSD. Um, we're working really closely with Vermont Emergency Management on the um, roll out of, and put together of the update to the state hazard mitigation plan. And so I think that really these efforts need to be continued to be coordinated and think about how we do this together. And the other agencies that you're reaching out to are coordinating, uh, have they generally, have any of them added staff to address this work or are they basically picking up the work with existing staff? Yeah, so in, I can think specifically, um, Agency of Transportation has started to reorganize and add staff to their environmental program. They have a resilience um, planner now, um, Heather Boyson, who's come on under Andrea Wright in her new role as um, environmental um, policy manager for AOT. I'm not I believe they have some additional capacity coming into that program specific on public engagement. Um, and then uh, Ryan Patch specifically, you know, he's had a very clearly articulated role now for the ag agency on climate rather than water quality traditionally, um, which was just an expansion and appreciation of the work that he was already doing. Um, and PSD, um, they are continually, I, I think, short staffed and looking to think about how they address that and bring added capacity. And that's something through the Inflation Reduction Act and others that, um, capacity that we're thinking a lot about how to do that for other agencies. So I want to, sorry, I feel like I might know the answer to this question, but VEM and AAFM. Yeah, sorry for all, I, I feel like in talking with the public, I should know better to use acronyms, but Vermont Emergency Management um, and um, Agency of Agriculture and Farm Markets. Okay. Yeah, and then it's Building General Services. And um, if you don't know, under Agency of Human Services, Department of Children and Families and the Depart Department of Health. Um, they actually have, you know, in DCF, Department of Children's and Family, they administer the lo um, low income weatherization assistance program. So have a very big role in administration of state weatherization programs. And then um, within VDH, they actually have a climate program um, within that, thinking about public health and the impacts, um, which is a really important way for us to connect with Vermonters around climate action. Is Sarah Phillips still at DCF? Yes, okay. she's still the director. So just as we started to think about um, what our role uh, was and appreciating that cli I, climate action, we think of it as a three-legged stool. Um, it's really just not about um, responding to climate change through cutting our emissions, but it's recognizing that 
um, there are impacts now, um, and that many of the programs that we, especially in ANR, already are doing a really good job of administering and putting on the ground. There are co-benefits beyond um, that you can think about for sequestering and storing carbon and building and um, enhancing resilience in both our natural and working lands um, and our downtowns and built environment. So in the staff for the Climate Action Office, um, we've been able to use a mix of new positions that were given to us last year, as well as redirecting positions that were already within the Agency of Natural Resources. So myself um, and Marion Wolves, who was also a new position given to ANR for the GWSA, were really um, in, um, serving the Climate Council for a year and a half, largely because that capacity was really needed to stand up the Climate Action Plan. While ANR will have a long-term responsibility and staffing um, the Climate Council with respect to being the fiduciary arm and administratively helping support them through meetings and help them um, meeting public meeting law, the capacity is not needed in the same level anymore. And so i would shifted to focus on the capacity and work of the Climate Action Office. Marion Wolves is now our focused on resilience and adaptation. And then three positions were moved over from the DEC Air Quality and Climate Division to both manage our climate change mitigation program, um, redirect them to be our climate change data and progress analysts to really think about standing up the tools needed to measure and track progress over time. Um, and then also our um, climate change mitigation and modeling coordinator, appreciating that um, much of the work of the Climate Action Office will continue to be analyses needed to foster and stand up future iterations of the Climate Action Plan, as well as um, manage our the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, the REGI program, which moved into the Climate Action Office from DEC. So we now um, monitor those auctions and do program administration for REGI. The two new positions that we're about to hire are community engagement and communications coordinator. So someone focused specifically on engagement as well as climate communications and then a natural and working lands position to coordinate really closely with the Ag Agency and others around the Natural and Working Lands Initiative. And you'll see when I speak to the work that we're implementing right now where those specific needs are going forward. And I will say we had one other additional new position granted to us in the budget last year for a staff of eight. That position was redirected from the climate office to our business office in the secretary's office, which we're actually really excited about because the business office and the secretary's office has always been very small, very discreet. As you can imagine, the secretary's office in A&R has not been really focused on programmatic work. It's been a discrete component of administration and um, policy through our secretary and deputy. Um, and now we have a new climate action office, a new EJ office, um, and an additional something like 14 new positions around ARPA and more. And so there are two new uh, positions within the business office to support us in um, raising revenue, um, getting new grants, being able to grant out and support the work on the ground. So shifting gears, um, the Climate Action Plan um, meets many of the objectives within um, the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, it was adopted on December 1st of 2021. We called it an initial climate action plan, appreciating that um, it was done under extremely tight timelines. There were buckets of work that I'll touch on briefly today that weren't completed um, in service of the Climate Action Plan's first um, adoption, namely around transportation and biomass that still needed further work. Um, and then we also appreciated that there's an ongoing public component and role of it. Um, and so wanted to appreciate that we could have done better, want to do better, and we'll continue to work with our members in the space. So there are um, obviously ambitious um, emissions reductions requirements um, laid out in this initial climate action plan policy solutions that many of which are handoff back to the legislature for you all to act on to help us reach our uh, fast approaching, approaching 2025 and 2030 targets. I will highlight the greenhouse gas inventory in a minute. And I know I heard some questions last week of Secretary Moore, so wanted to give you an update briefly on where we're at with emission, um, with the greenhouse gas inventory coming out um, in the coming weeks. 
Institute. We were able to develop and work closely with the Just Transition Subcommittee to set in place the guiding principles, which are foundational in the environmental justice law as well and reference there. That was really a framework and parameter for how we thought about solutions and recommendations in the Climate Action Plan. Um, and our, the Just Transitions Committee is continuing to think about how they oversee the implementation of those um, principles on the ongoing work of the Climate Action Plan. Again, the subcommittees were really where the impetus and work for the Climate Action Plan and recommendations were developed, and they were able to lift up what is a very comprehensive plan, 24 pathways, 64 strategies, and really those operational actions needed to move us forward. Um, and then finally, we put forward a framework for how we were going to measure and track progress, but that's really the critical work of the Climate Action Office in the coming years. So I'm sure you've seen this slide before, um, the Energy Action Network, and I know um, uh, Councillor Duval um, is coming in to speak with you later this week. Um, he uses, they, I should say, they use the data that the state produces um, to put together their progress report on an annual basis. Um, this most recent um, data here included here is in, from 2018. Um, it shows where the um, most heavily producing sectors are, that being transportation and buildings and thermal. Um, and it shows you where we're headed um, with respect to the need to cut our emissions first in 2025 and obviously much more aggressively in <coughs> 2030. I will say that um, our goal for the greenhouse gas inventory coming out of the Climate Action Office is that it's been inconsistent at best on how we produce and update the data. The most recent greenhouse gas inventory was actually 2017. It was produced last year. So in 2021, we produced the 2017 data, so four years behind. Um, and so we're now working to get up to date on 2018, 19, and 20. And so our expectation is in this first quarter, uh, we have a draft report already, um, we will produce an updated greenhouse gas inventory that takes us all the way through 2020. Um, and then are working really closely with the Climate Council through their science and data subcommittee to ensure that we have a, a methodology that is agreed upon, publicly vetted, and a process to make changes to that, appreciating that as we get closer to the 2025 and 2030, um, requirements that we need to be um, in agreement and producing the inventory on a consistent annual timeline so that there's expectations to see how we're doing um, and how we're meeting it since it's the legal backstop for the emissions reductions requirements. So we'll see uh, a draft emissions report in the first quarter of 23. Is that correct? You'll see a final one. We're, we're okay. vetting the draft internally right now. Okay. Okay. That's there. Why that? Why that gap? Yeah. Is that just because you got a late start? No, nope. this only started because of recently passed legislation. Yeah. So um, they're just until the Global Warming Solutions Act, there wasn't a heightened focus on the greenhouse gas inventory and lacking staff and resources. I will say that the lag in data is going without a change in the data sources that we use for the inventory. That lag will always be there. We rely on, except for the transportation sector, we now get um, accurate and consistent timely data from DMV. We signed an MOU with the DMV a number of years ago in negotiations when we were looking at joining the TCI program. So we are able to get our fuel data for transportation vehicles from DMV on an annual basis. There's refinements that we'd like to see to that data to do better emissions reporting on different fuel types. Different types of diesel have different types of emission factors. But the thermal sector, we rely almost exclusively, well, not almost, we rely exclusively on national models. And so th there is a real need, and that is something I'm sure you'll talk about and think about with the Affordable Heat Act, how we get better data for the fuel sector. That would also be more timely data that would allow us to produce the inventory on a, a better, a, a more timely um, trajectory. Uh, Secretary Moore mentioned that right now they're, I think you're sort of closing in on finalizing a tax, which has 
I don't know the granularity of that data, but because of the excise tax and the fuel, they have much more current, just like EMP, they have more current data. I just don't know how granular it is. That was the question that came up. We've been working really closely with tax um, and others to understand um, how we can harmonize the data so that there wouldn't be an additional reporting requirement on fuel dealers. That would require much, they, rec they collect data currently on all fuels that are burned in homes, not propane versus home heating oil versus natural gas. And so we would need uh, to have a change made to the reporting um, that the IRS forms used in that space in order to get the data we would need to use in the inventory. So we've been talking with them about what the needs are to um, change the forms, what's the process internally for them to change forms, um, and how we would do that. But each, for each company that reports for a particular kind of fuel, I'm hoping that under the hood there's more detail that has that could be brought forward in a proprietary way. I mean, to protect proprietary information, but still provide the data. Yes, they would. They do not have the data currently that we need. So we have two hurdles. We have to ask for more refined data of fuel dealers through that form. Um, and we've made suggestions to tax on so they could see what our expectation or needs would be. Um, and then there's confidentiality um, hurdles with taking tax data. And we've been working closely to understand what would be needed through legislative action to overcome the confidentiality agreement. They do share data currently with other state agencies. Uh, did they share data with ECF for low income organization, for instance? I don't actually know that. I, the only example that we have found is they share data with our waste management section. Um, and that is something that we've been speaking with um, Josh Kelly on to understand what that looks like for that words. Thank you. Um, this is a really interesting topic around the data. And I, I guess what I want to just clarify is it sounds like this is not an insurmountable hurdle. And that potentially, even as drafted, what I'm hearing is the Affordable Heat Act could have some refined fuel data that we could identify through the process of creation of, you know, until we get to 2026 when it's launched. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to that, if I'm hearing you properly. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to speak specifically to the Affordable Heat Act right now. Um, I will say that it, it would need, we have to overcome hurdles with respect to data, not only for building and home heating, but also there are questions around fuel. We would want more refinements made to the data with DMV. So we've been thinking about how to harmonize data for both transportation and buildings and thermal. And that's a work in progress that's um, hopefully coming to a head in the coming days. Okay, so, okay. Senator Watson has not asked anything this morning. Oh, I'll defer to her. I missed the signal, sorry. No, it's okay. Well. Uh, uh, just curious of the process there. It's kind of a newbie question, but uh, when so let's say the uh, you know staff administration comes up with a uh, suggestion around that, they will come to this committee. No, what will, what will happen? I would like to I defer to Secretary Moore on next steps with that process, but she's directed her staff to continue to work to understand what the needs are to harmonize data in order to have a fuel report program. And so that might not, it might not come to this group, it could just be the executive order kind of thing. I'm not sure if that. I'm not sure yet okay. how that okay. will play out. Okay. Um, well, and so that way, that, you know, we, it was helpful. Secretary Moore said last week, uh, she said, well, I'm not only here to point out problems. I'll be back with, I always I did suggestions and solutions, which is very helpful to us. And I think we're very conscious of the whole need for good data, so that's a data driven program. And I think that's probably why we have a, a lengthy timeline with a, I'd say, a deep rule making along the way. So, Senator Clark. Thanks. We get annual reports on pretty much everything. Why? What is the difficulty of getting more recent information? 
Yeah, so from, are you speaking to the EAN progress reports? Yeah. Yeah, so they're relying on our annual inventories to produce their annual report, which is roughly three to four years behind in data. So just because you're getting an annual report doesn't mean it's reflective of a current year. Um, they're using the data that is produced annually. Where our lag has been, it has been in buildings and thermal sector. That is a SIT module produced by the EP, the Environmental Protection Agency, that we are not given for a number of years after the year it's produced. The other area where we, I would say that fuel reporting data would not allow us to get us further to produce the whole greenhouse gas inventory. On a more on an annual basis that was more reflective with the calendar year, still because the um, land use sector is also relies on a national model, and that one tends to lag even farther behind the buildings and thermal. However, our two largest sectors, the ones that we are most interested in and in understanding how we're doing for emissions reductions, are transportation and buildings and thermal, and we are we would be much closer and better served to have those two sectors to have annual state data that would allow us to produce um, annual progress reports concurrent or shortly after concurrent with the calendar year. So that would be a much better progress report and indicator of how we're doing with our emissions reduction. How would we do, how would we achieve that? What would be needed? That's what we were just speaking to, better information from the tax department if that's the way we are able to move forward where we're still not 100% sure yet on that but better information from the tax department as well as some more refined data from DMV. As a layperson, mm -hmm. this is a citizen legislature. You're the expert, okay? So it must be very frustrating to get questions that reflect okay. a <laughs> lack of comprehension. But explain to me why I'm wrong. I think five-year-old information is useless. Oh, I, I think you're I, right too. I, oh, I, think, okay. I think we would be much better served as a state that has statutory requirements for our emissions reductions to be one to two years out on the data, not producing um, a greenhouse gas inventory in 2028 that tells you that we hit or didn't hit our 2025 emissions reduction. Because that is the way the GWSA is written right now, is there is no hook there, the statutory hook speaks to the greenhouse gas inventory. And right now, you won't, we will not have that information for three to four years after the emissions reductions requirement. What was it that was on, on the evening news last week that we have slipped behind? We're not reducing or actually increasing our contribution. So this is the most current data and what 2020 shows you is that we actually dropped quite a bit. This was the pandemic year and this is something we'll be looking really closely at how far we rebound in the transportation sector in particular because most of those reductions were in the transportation space from lack of driving, commuting, um, traveling around the state. So the question becomes, how much are we gonna go back up? You know, and on this whole data question, I mean, to me, it's like, we can all be somewhat frustrated, but it, it's only more recently that the attention has come down to, let's get to the yes. nuts and bolts of what's going on and get data and make it more contemporary and all the rest. So yeah. I feel like on all fronts, we're making progress. It's just that we, never asked for it at this level of detail before when we didn't need it in such a timely way. I think that's true. So briefly, I'll go through sort of the five areas of focus over the last year and highlight some successes in the climate action space, highlight the space of uh, ongoing work and speak to priorities for 2023. So in the mitigation space, clearly our largest success was that um, we were able to advance the implementation of a package of rules associated with clean vehicles. Um, we built upon decades of clean car regulations in Vermont um, that speak to an increasing percentage of electric vehicles to be delivered to the state, as well as adopted a new rule um, around our medium and heavy duty fleet advanced clean trucks. Um, advanced clean cars too ultimately will lead to a phase out of all internal combustion engine sales for 2035 in the light dude in the passenger car and light duty truck um, arena um, and an increasing percentage um, for the medium and heavy duty with um, I think roughly one 
um, area of that being 65% and uh, um, other fleet components only being 35%, appreciating that we're not as far along with medium and heavy duty technology as we are with um, passenger car technology. I like to emphasize that this is building upon decades of work in Vermont. Um, Vermont had followed uh, California um, it, with the first advanced clean cars. And if we had not built upon with advanced clean cars too, we would have actually reverted to federal car standards. And so this is really um, an important piece of work. And I will highlight the only regulatory rules required in the climate action plan. Um, as you may or may not know, within the Global Warming Solutions Act, rules that are put forward in the climate action plan, our a &R is required to advance on a certain timeline or also there's a different statutory suit provision where people can bring suit to us if we don't do those rules. This it was a really great test for us because this was building upon years of work that we had already done, um, but really nothing short of a miracle that we were able to do it on the timeline. Staff worked really hard on this um, and we actually adopted sooner than California and had to wait for California to uh, adopt the rules formally. So um, another component of success in the mitigation space, I should pause one more time and say that these rules um, for transportation between now and 2030 are expected to get us about one third of the emissions reductions required from the transportation sector. Um, but as you look beyond 2030, um, the percent really ramps up um, and if you look out to the 2050 emission reduction requirements for transportation, these rules will get us all the way there um, on their own, but they will not get us there fast enough for the emissions reduction requirements by the GWSA. But um, appreciating that our vehicle fleet turns over roughly every decade. Um, if you cannot buy um, internal combustion engine vehicles new in 2035, about a decade later, you will see largely almost all electric vehicles in Vermont. So the mechanism for that one third reduction by 2030, is that because there will be higher mileage vehicles from the bottom of 2026 on, so for the last four years or so, plus we're going to get low and no uh, emission vehicles in. So that portion of the fleet will grow. Yes, 100. I was going to say, Senator McDonald frequently makes the point that today's new car is tomorrow's used car. So the time that we have to take into account, uh, even if everything manufactured, everything being sold new is electric. Right. And a lot of people are going to be driving gas customers. Yeah, for a while. And and I will say that um, you know the one of the challenges in the transportation space um, beyond doing additional policy action beyond these rules is that these the um, emissions reductions requirements that I'm citing with one third coming from these rules imagines that 100% of the electric vehicles delivered to Vermont are placed in Vermont. Mm. Um, so that doesn't mean so we, we will be getting a lot of electric vehicles delivered to us over time because of these rules. People from New Hampshire who have not adopted these rules may be coming to Vermont to buy them and therefore those vehicles will go elsewhere. So the one third is imagining the greatest emission reduction benefits you can possibly get. It also is the highest end of the model for electric vehicles delivered between now and 2030. So the question becomes, um, if you were to act more enact more policy in the transportation space, but there's no more electric vehicles envisioned between now and 2030, where else do the emissions reductions come from in the transportation space? It's a really challenging space to think about where else to get cuts from. Senator McDonald and Senator White. So we manufacture automobiles that use less gas every single year. But when you look at new car sales, the new car sales don't reflect the, the advances in energy reduction because people have a lot of money. So the ones that buy big expensive new cars that burn a lot of gas. What's the, what's the plan on that? Well, um, the advanced clean cars rules have um, also have components around um, vehicle efficiency, as you're mentioning. So the vehicles that are internal combustion engine vehicles remaining will become more efficient over time because of these rules. 
That said, people can still buy the cars that they choose to buy, especially if they have the money to buy so. So there are other recommendations within the Climate Action Plan and elsewhere that speak to um, incentives or uh, regulatory approaches that could be taken to drive um, vehicle efficiency purchases. One of the recommendations in the Climate Action Plan is for a fee bait program. And so that is still a recommendation. And I will say that the last component here under um, uh, success is we did adopt an addendum to the Climate Action Plan this last year. It really reinforces the other recommendations in the Climate Action Plan where action has not been taken and says there are still viable recommendations in this space to move forward to meet further advanced emissions reductions. But the challenge does really become the most cost efficient way to drive emissions reductions in this space is through electric vehicle placement. And we are not, the Climate Action Plan calls for 127,000 EVs between now and 2030. The highest end of the modeling between um, for advanced clean cars will deliver roughly 80 to 90,000. Um, and we're currently at 7,500 on the road right now. So it just becomes a sheer number, like we're just not gonna have enough electric vehicles between now and 2030. Um, and so there are po other policy options in the plan to think about how we um, encourage, enhance folks to purchase at least um, more efficient vehicles outside of electric vehicles will be critical. And what's the plan? Uh, well, the plan includes one thing would be the vehicle efficiency rebate or fee bait as called, which would, but the question is how, and I think the answer is not out there is how high do you have to drive that tax to actually force people's hand? I mean, all analyses to date that show carbon taxes, things like that are not, they're very cost prohibitive and don't give you a high confidence that you would actually meet the emissions reductions based on them. So we are doing a transportation analysis. Um, in, um, on the other hand, a priority for 2023 is that um, this transportation addendum for the climate action plan signals to the carbon reduction strategy that the agency of transportation is advancing through iija through the bipartisan infrastructure bill one of the pots of money was the carbon reduction strategy and for the agency of transportation to take that money they had to agree to move forward with the transportation sector analysis this will be the first vermont specific analysis that um, phase one is only draft right now, but it really looked at how far can we pull the policy levers of the capital bill. So like the programs that AOT is already deploying, how far can we pull those levers to drive emissions reductions? And the answer preliminarily is no, nowhere near far enough, right? You, you need broader policy. And so the phase two, um, which state um, agencies, um, nonprofit sectors, uh, CAP agencies, we're all sitting on an advisory panel to Agency of Transportation and Cambridge Analytics is looking at a sector-wide policy and policy design that would make up for the whole for TCIP and the Climate Action Plan. 73% of the automobiles that are purchased and registered in the state of Vermont are used cars. What's the plan to, to discontinue the flooding of the used car lots with Yes, yeah. I don't have a specific plan there, except for I do think that the rules, because the increasing percentage of electric vehicles, one of the greatest components of that is over time, more of them will be available um, as used vehicles, which will be more cost effective. Point, point. So we want more gas guzzlers to put all our money into the electric or efforts into the electric vehicle basket. Is that? I'm not policy? personally ignoring it, but I'm just is appreciating. That a the policy right now is to drive more, a greater market share for electric vehicles, which will hopefully trickle down to the used market share over time. With the fee bait discussion that's happening, where and how might we, how might that appear? Yeah, that hasn't, I mean, that came up in the legislative legislature last year in House Transportation and elsewhere, um, and it never went anywhere yet. Um, but that I imagine that, you know, they are speaking to the transportation section and the climate action plan in more detail today in House Transportation with VTRANS. And so my hope is that they will ask them those questions. So the administration is in speaking to transportation today. Yes. Saying reduce the number of gas guzzlers being sold. They're speaking to the initiatives they're putting on the ground to complement uh, broader policy for transportation outside of electric vehicles. Oh. So bike ped, 
vehicle efficiency, all the other components that are part of a comprehensive approach to reducing emissions in transportation. What, what role is uh, reducing, I mean, like expanding enforcement speed limits that, that, that when unenforced burn more? I saw that question. Necessary to go to grandma's house on Sunday. Complete. That was something that was brought up in the planning for the climate action plan. Um, and we did, I saw that question was asked of Secretary Moore and um, I helped our general counsel provide an answer to all of you um, in his comments last week. And that was something that was con considered by the transportation trans uh, task group, Johanna Miller and Gina Campoli led that. And um, it, there's not a recommendation in the climate action plan around reducing speed limits, but they should be, they could answer why in more detail, but it was something that was discussed at great length. Okay. So it sounds like if there were to be a fee rate plan rolled out, it needs a legislative introduction to get it moving. That's where it came from last year, yeah. yes. <laughs> So let's keep going. Yeah, just to wrap up I, on mitigation more broadly, I will say that the climate action plan, um, because of the, you are moving forward with the Affordable Heat Act, but TCIP, um, when that, the transportation um, conservation initiative program, when that fell apart and the viability of that was no longer um, an option because of Connecticut and Massachusetts pulled out the sector by sector approach that was taken uh, for the initial climate action plan um, essentially went away. Um, and we as an administration in thinking about analyses of um, how to reduce emissions for transportation and buildings and thermal are thinking about it not only sector by sector now, but what is the administrative benefit as well as the emissions reduction benefit of thinking comprehensively across our two sectors. So we are advancing um, as you know, an analysis of the buildings and um, thermal sector right now with Energy Futures Group at the helm of that analysis. Agency of Transportation is also doing the same with Cambridge Analytics for transportation. And we're working to also analyze what an all fuels program could pro cap and invest, cap and reduce or performance standard could look like. Um, and what are the efficiencies of trying to move forward with one program rather than a sector by sector approach appreciating the administrative um, constraints in that space. So the analyses will converge is our hope this coming year to look at the, across. I remember trying to help fuel some energy efficiency program once in a long time. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, TCI, I have a really quick data question. I'm looking at your January 15th report. Uh, we can just get more time with you because there's a lot of good information here. Thanks for that. It says that under TCI, the, the estimated approximate reduction in emissions is 10%. Is that 10% of the of the 40% reduction, or is that 10% as in now you have 30% to go? Yeah, the latter is my understanding. But you, I, if I get this wrong, I'm way more than happy to follow up um, with Jerry to Councillor Duvall. Um, but my understanding is that TCIP was expected to reduce emissions 38% across the regions in enrollment, and the model benefit for Vermont would be, was roughly 10% to realize roughly 10% of those regional emissions reductions, because TCI would have directed emissions reductions with those revenues to where they were most cost effective. Rural, reducing emissions in rural states is not mostly the most cost effective way to do it often. And so um, the estimate was 10% of the transportation emissions. Okay. So we still would have had significantly far to go with transportation on it, its own. Sure. Um, yeah. The one immediately preceding, since we're talking about data. So under clean heat standard, it estimates 34% uh, reaction. So that's 34% of 40% required by 2030. Yeah, it will. Obviously, the clean heat standard was. Um, written to meet the emissions reductions yeah. for that sector for the requirements. Yes. Great. I just want to make sure that it's not 34%, like as in one third of the total that we need to reduce. And the analysis that we're now doing with EFG in this space will take the originally we had looked um, advanced the clean heat standard that almost passed last year um, with EFG and we're now updating that analysis to look at the affordable heat at S5 yeah. so that we'll have um, be able to review that bill very closely with respect to the criteria we've set within the analysis around cost effectiveness, around um, equity, around um, cost per ton for emissions reductions, those kinds of constraints. Great. Um, 
paper. My understanding of Secretary Moore is there's a blueprint version of that report due in the beginning of March, later in March, early April. There's a final version. Is that kind of sound right still? The first task, which I suspect your committee will be really interested in, is a qualitative analysis of 10 policy options to reduce emissions for the buildings and thermal sector, Look, reviewing um, almost 20 different um, analyses that have happened um, either regionally or nationally. Um, so while there hasn't been a Vermont-specific analysis done on a performance standard to reduce emissions in the building's thermal sector, there's been a lot of analyses, including like the one that JFO did a number of years ago to decarbonize and others. And so we've asked EFG to review those 20 different analyses and do a qualitative analysis of the criteria that they'll then take further to do a more quantitative analysis. That's actually due February 1st. And I think that will be of interest as you're discussing that's fact. Great, thanks for that heads up. Um, can you just say briefly what you mean by performance standards? I think the term flows around a little bit. So a performance standard in the thermal sector means what? Um, I think of I, I think of it as very similar to a cap. You have a performance set standard where you set a, um, a cap on emissions, but you incentivize good behavior underneath, or a cap where you disincentivize the bad behavior above the cap. So I just think of them very in simplest terms. I think of it that way. But there's but with both of them, there's a set for where emissions from that sector will be for an annual basis. So the performance is the program meeting the target. The required reduction in greenhouse gases, right? Okay. Yes. Um, thanks. I mean, it's another quiz. It's just that I hear the term used a little differently, so I just want to make sure I understand how your office uses it. Thank you. I'll start to move quickly because I'm not sure how much time I have left for you all. But we have, we booked the morning, so we have to renew. Hopefully, we <coughs> go outside in the middle of your presentation about who comes. So i um, happy to answer more questions and speak to the report um, as I wrap up too, but just to highlight some of the exciting other work happening as required by the GWSA outside of mitigation. Um, one of the outstanding um, requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act was the development of a municipal climate toolkit. Um, so we have really taken this um, idea and run with it to not only sort of assemble tools and resources for uh, municipalities and Vermont landowners, but really think about how to also encourage and support added capacity in that space. So Marion Wolfs, our resilience and adaptation um, coordinator has been working with the multifaceted um, task group that includes climate counselors, select board members, UVM um, officials to work to um, assimilate the information and develop a web-based tool um, in order to encourage and um, climate action planning at the municipal level. Our hope is to roll that out this spring. Um, and there are components um, in uh, the Agency of Natural Resources budget request around um, further funding for rollout and capacity through RPCs and municipalities to actually use the municipal toolkit. Um, one of the... Uh, wondering if municipal in this sense applies to school districts. Yeah, we have. I'm not. I'd have to defer to Marion on whether or not that's been thought in the process. Um, it's really been about town planning and select boards, if I'm correct. Okay. Okay, thank you. So a few years ago, we did the energy siting work. And yep. We did grants through the OCT Coast Department to help towns build a town energy element into their town plan. And they went ahead and they did that and they got, uh, it was reviewed and accepted and certified. Then in a PSB PUC proceeding, they had, they were granted substantial deference rather than consideration. So that was the carrot. I'm just wondering if there's a real world consequence of using the toolkit that's gonna, other than doing better planning, if there's something that they'll be kind of eligible for that would make it an attractive thing to invest their time and energy in? It's a great question. Um, there isn't right now, but we've been looking at other states like Massachusetts have um, some carrots around you doing climate action planning and how you access state funding and state grants. That's not something we have in place right now in Vermont. We've been coordinating with other states to think about approaches to drive climate action at municipality level.
Um, one of the major struggles in this space continues to be metrics to sort of track how we're doing around building resilience and adaptation. I'm sure you've heard there's been a consistent um, sort of uh, pounding on the door that the Global Warming Solutions Act puts mitigation above resilience and adaptation, largely because that's quantifiable, measurable um, reduction requirements and a more abstract uh, role around the objectives to meet resilience and adaptation until you get to the net zero requirement in 2050, um, which is far out. So we've been thinking a lot about how to quantify and meet the objectives of resilience and adaptation and something that we'll be thinking about as we stand up the measuring and tracking progress tool. So we have a consistent um, objective to be reaching. Um, one of the priorities in 2023 is the completion of the municipal vulnerability index tool that was a requirement of the GWSA and something that we have under contract now with um, ERG out of Boston to develop an interactive online tool that actually reviews and analyzes different municipalities and where their vulnerabilities are. This will merge, we hope, with the Department of Public Health. We've been working really closely on, on it to show where there's actual hazard mitigation and resilience challenges with social vulnerabilities so that that's a real resource for people to plan and prioritize where funding goes and resources are allocated. Are RPCs not doing this kind of already? Not in any substantive way that I know, no. So just as a real world example for what you're describing, would it be a mapping, to, just trying to understand, would it be, let's say a mapping tool for Hartford or Bethel, where we know that some of the low line mobile home locations are in, they're not in good spots. Yeah. Is it where you could identify those locations when you say social vulnerabilities, like trying to support low and moderate income Vermonters or, yeah, I guess I'm trying to understand like what it would actually provide. Well, not only would it show you where those kinds of resources are in your communities or populations, but um, they would show specific vulnerabilities like where a culvert is undersized yeah. that would show where you could leverage um, the most impactful, like over, like resizing of a culvert so that that community is less vulnerable from flooding in the future. Um, it also show, will show heat vulnerabilities and others yeah. um, components around that. And building off of that, a component that we've requested um, is to think about how to um, demonstrate um, how to make these investments costly, um, cost effective we recently completed a marginal cost abatement curve for mitigation strategies that actually, that should be linked in the report that I shared with all of you and there's a section in it that speaks to um, what are the um, impacts um, and costs over time of investing in mitigation strategies. We'd really like to create the same for resilience and adaptation, uh, understanding that a lot of times those um, avoided costs of um, hazards and flooding, um, we can really be able to demonstrate the in, um, um, imperative to act now to avoid those costs later. Um, natural and working lands. Um, for the Climate Action Plan, we were able to stand up the um, first ever carbon budget comprehensive in the state of Vermont. This is something that we'd like to do on an ongoing basis, but it was able to demonstrate the sequestration and storage of our natural and working lands, which is roughly 5 million um, metric tons on an annual basis for that snapshot in time that we were able to do. So just for um, relationships to our greenhouse gas emissions, we produce on an annual basis 8 million metric tons of um, CO2 equivalents. And so right now we sequester 5 million metric tons. Um, and so that, those, that capacity and storage is something that we want to not only protect but enhance over time, um, understanding that the trend has been that we've been losing it uh, through conversion and development of our natural lands. 15,000 acres a year. Um, we have um, ongoing work um, that we were not able to complete in 2022 around recommendations in the biomass space. Um, we had um, a series of recommendations that were tabled for the Climate Action Plan in 2021 because they came up from the Ag and Ecosystems Subcommittee and weren't cross-pollinated with the mitigation folks. 
And so we've really honed a task group that is comprised of folks from the Just Transition Subcommittee, Ag and Ecos, um, Ag and Ecosystems Mitigation and Science and Data, looking at biomass um, for electricity purposes, largely um, in this group. It's hard to isolate biomass for electricity only and not talk about it for home heating and impacts on forest conservation and keeping our forests for us. But it's really been largely around the role of McNeil and the role of Rygate as future components of our climate as a climate solution or not, um, and what the continued work is. And there's a set of really robust draft recommendations that are linked in the legislative report um, that have, while had an opportunity for counselors to review, has not been deliberated on by the council yet. Um, and our hope in the coming months, I think many of you probably heard there were eight house seats that went up um, that were no longer on the council. So we had eight vacancies. And so we had to cancel our December meeting. Six of those eight seats have now been reappointed by the speaker. And we have two vacancies around representing um, municipalities and the energy sector right now are the two vacant seats. Um, and so as those get filled in the coming weeks, we'll look to take up the biomass recommendations pretty quickly thereafter. Really quick question on the, so we're very CO2E uh, focused for understandable reasons, but uh, with wood burning, whether for energy or heat, there's health concerns around microparticulates. So is that when we have that discussion around emissions for in terms of greenhouse gases, are we also including Sort of the full set of emissions so that we're mindful of health impacts of micro particulates. So, as you may or may not know, in the greenhouse gas inventory, um, biogenic emissions are not accounted for in the gross emissions that you see. And so, um, there is roughly 2 million metric tons of greenhouse gas um, emissions from burning wood and largely in home heating um that is not accounted for in our greenhouse gas inventory on an annual basis that's a iipc like that is um the way all states do it except i should allocate maine has just switched in the last year to accounting for biogenic emissions in their gross inventory um, one of the things that you'll see uh, as a priority for 2023 is that Vermont has a seat at the table right now on a um, cross-state initiative with Maine and Massachusetts, where we're looking really closely at how we account for biogenic emissions, what is the accounting that we do around um, the sequestration also, and where on the ledger in the greenhouse gas inventory things get accounted for, do they get accounted for in the gross emissions versus the net emissions, and are we consistently doing that across the region? There's a lot of interest from states like Massachusetts, as you can imagine, who are going to have a really hard time meeting their net zero requirements ever in understanding what the accounting looks like and if there's would ever be an interest in sort of an exchange. That is not something Vermont and Maine are interested in talking about yet, sort of selling our sequestration, but it is an interest in other states to think about that for long term. Um, net zero goals. So we're talking about um, emissions, um, how we account for them, how we track it long term, and how we consistently communicate where they're accounted for. But certainly when we got to our net zero requirement, um, we would not want to count that 2 million metric tons of sequestration that from that um, what we're burning right now for biogenic emissions. So really a challenging and a very contentious issue, as you would imagine, around um, cutting trees, not cutting trees, burning wood, all of that. So our state uh, emissions were 8 million metric tons, but it doesn't include 2 million metric tons of emissions related to wood burning. Yes, but and we are good. That has, I should say, that in our greenhouse gas inventory, the, those biogenic emissions are have always been there. We've always told people what they are, but it's been in the back of the inventory. And we're actually reconsidering how we communicate biogenic emissions in this inventory rolling out. Um, in the Addison County inventory, they do it differently. They use um, a different global warming potential um, for um, biogenic emissions, but they do account them in the gross ledger. And so Richard Hopkins, who um, sits on the science and data subcommittee, 
we've been thinking a lot about different ways to do that and statewide inventory um, and looking at other approaches. Okay, so plus two for emissions. How yeah. about if, if there a good news to throw into that category that I said minus X for uh, sequestration? Yeah, minus five. Minus five, thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same request. Yeah, um, just we've got some constituents, I'm sure others do as well, who are just basically accusing us of uh, greenwashing bio. Well, I believe very strongly um, in for like in keeping a working landscape working contributes to having forests to provide all of the co-benefits that they provide, including resilience and adaptation. Do I believe sink. and that carbon sink? Yeah. Do I believe we need to account and consider different components across forests? Yes, and think about the role in a changing climate. Yes, but we're doing that at ANR and thinking a lot about how we manage our lands to meet multiple values. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, there's this is this could be a week long discussion, yeah. so I'm just uh -huh. so I well, we have 14 weeks, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We have our I will say that we see this as an important role in broadening the scope of climate action and talking about this. We had a climate change forester in SPR, she left and is now with UVM Monitoring Cooperative. I hope that position within Forest Parks and Recs gets rehired and is really where sort of the work that happens in the Climate Action Office is translated to staff on the ground managing our you know, 350,000 acres of land that we own as an agency. Um, but we are hiring a natural and working lands position within the Climate Action Office to think about how we message, discuss forest management, um, as well as all of the co-benefits and values that forests provide. For many years, as for my own home heating and also for uh, work as a legislator, I've been comfort, comforted by the distinction between sequestered carbon and carbon, the carbon cycle. And now there are people who dismiss that as nonsense. They say it's carbon is carbon. Right. We put the carbon on it. Want to comment <clears throat> on the the carbon cycle? We're going to keep going. I think. It was <laughs> he's he's taking me on a science class. I actually have a master's in forest ecology, so we, I could talk to you about sequestration well, for a long time. If not now, perhaps. Sometime. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I, I will say that the final component on this slide highlights just our a better need for in the same space for agriculture, right? The way we track our emissions in the agricultural sector right now is at a very gross level. It's about acres and cows, right? And we are not able to give the added value of those practices that are put on our agricultural lands, those co-benefits of carbon sequestration, as well as reducing the gross emissions that we do for all that farmers are already being asked to do with respect to water quality and all the other things we ask of our working lands. Um, and so we're working really closely with the ag agency right now to look at a better tool to account for our gross and net emissions in the agricultural sector that I hope will update and further refine the way we track emissions in the agricultural sector. Because if you noted on that slide earlier, um, unlike other states, our third largest sector in Vermont is not electricity. We've done a really great job with the renewable energy standard. It's agriculture and it's 16% of our emissions. And so um, we want to make sure that um, we are seeing ag as part of the climate solution in providing a resilient and adaptive landscape, but we're also holding them accountable to cut emissions where appropriate and in the best way possible to ensure that they're there for us. Um, and Senator McCormick, so I don't mean to like just stop us. From, there's getting the accounting right accounts for a lot. So I, lot. I, I just know it's going to be a deep, a deep well we could go down. I also respect as chair, you have a duty to move the discussion along. Air, air traffic is somewhat fine. resembling the, the agenda. I do understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 somewhat resembling the agenda. Okay. okay. So, on the line of better data and measuring progress, I do want to um, highlight Colin Smythe. He has done the greenhouse gas inventory for roughly a decade within the Air Quality and Climate Division. He's now in the Climate Action Office and um, focused exclusively on how we measure and track progress. He'll be thinking about um, the greenhouse gas inventory, the tools needed to, associated with that, 
as well as standing up our measuring and uh, tracking progress tool. Um, as we you know, um, as I already noted, we'll be working to catch us up on the greenhouse gas inventory through 2020. Um, I do believe that will roll out in the next four to six weeks, a final greenhouse gas inventory, but certainly in this first quarter of 2023. Um, again, um, there are tools needed to better understand how we look at the natural and working land sector, agriculture, but also around the accounting of our forests um, and understanding which side of the ledger it goes on. Um, and that's something we'll be thinking a lot about um, going forward. In addition, we're completing our first life cycle analysis for energy use that has also been contracted with um, ERG. Um, and that is something that will be done um, by June, I believe that contract ends, um, June 2023. And they're looking at a life cycle analysis for all of Vermont's energy use, including uh, biomass and biofuels, so that we'll have a framework that we can carry forward into future years to run sensitivities on different energy choices. Um, and of course, have a larger picture of Vermont's impact on the choices we make with energy outside of our borders, since the inventory only looks at our emissions inside Vermont, but not at choices like natural gas and other things from outside of the state. So for on that side of things, uh, is the embodied, uh, embodied emissions going to be accounted for in import, imported grains, imported fertilizers, where there's already a fair amount of energy expended for emissions produced? And producing the product that gets imported, even though it's just landing in Vermont, do we account for, or will we be accounting for that? In for biofuels specifically, is that what you're asking? Well, no, just in general. I mean, in the dairy yeah. sector, there's a lot of grains get imported, mm -hmm. which has been the source of a lot of our phosphorus problem. But yes. there's also the uh, synthetic fertilizers that get created that have a carbon footprint. Um, and then when we grow our own crops, there's all the diesel burn to get out and feel. So we'll be looking specifically at energy use, not our whole economy of um, like where we produce inventory um, emissions, I should say. We are participating currently with the Environmental Protection Agency to do a consumption based inventory as well. Um, obviously, I've, I've heard numbers that we account for roughly 20% of actual emissions in our inventory. When you think about people buying things from Amazon or importing, none of those emissions are accounted for when that product gets like, delivered to your doorstep, except for perhaps the fuel used in the delivery truck. And so there are real issues um, and there was a lot of debate about how to do the best inventory for Vermont and um, we we will likely carry forward and I know in S5 there is a requirement of ANR to do a sensitivity analysis a life cycle analysis going forward as complementary to our inventory. Great I've heard that for instance where people get unhappy about what's going on in China something like 20 percent of their emissions are related to producing products for export to the US. Yes, that is true. Um, and the final thing I'll just say is we have a um, luckily a robust budget to move forward with um, the development of the measuring and assessing progress tool. That tool that we hope to stand up um, will be much more than um, emissions reductions. It will look at metrics that we are tracking and keeping tabs on that will hopefully um, result in progress on mitigation activities, but also around resilience and adaptation and um, components like equity around looking at how we, how many Vermonters did we engage with? How many events did we hold? How many uh, partners did we work with? We've been looking really closely at Colorado and other states who have done an excellent job in setting up dashboards and communication tools. And this report that you received from the Climate Council this year is what I like to think of as a placeholder for what would be a much more robust climate progress report delivered to the legislature on an annual basis in the coming years. Um, the RFP for this um, tool is set up to be really robust stakeholder and public engagement over the next year and like another year from now moving into building the actual tool once we've heard from Vermonters and ad, um, and other agencies around what data is already being collected and what kind of data do we need um, in the future to do a good job of telling uh, a compelling story. Is Emily Bird still that name? Emily Bird? Yeah. Yeah, I talk, talk with her all the time. I, although I heard, I, I was laughing because 
Of course, Secretary Moore, her passion is in clean water. She points me to talk with Emily Bird quite often on the clean water report. And then I heard the picture heavy like report <laughs> from the council. And I was like, oh, but I kind of like that picture heavy <laughs> report. Maybe other people like it though. So yeah, we've been, I, she, that is a model though yeah. on how state government can really serve um, a compelling. I mean, that's why I mentioned because it was much, uh, I would say, maybe I like pictures. I know I do. But yeah, yeah, before yeah, it became I think, a lot more um, apprehensible for legislators, at least, and maybe I think the public at large, when it got reformatted, yes, new sorts of data got pulled in. And more user friendly. I think so too. And I, yeah, I think the world of Emily Bird. So she's been really helpful in thinking about how, how, how she also sits at the center of collecting data from other state agencies and the pros and cons of how to do that well. Okay, final slide. Just do want to emphasize that um, community engagement has been front and center and really thinking about and re envisioning how state government works with Vermonters. Um, I would argue um, state government is very good at putting out a plan and telling people what's in the plan and reacting to it, but actually co collaboration and thinking about how we develop solutions is something that we're really thinking about how to do that um, better going forward. The Climate Action Office has base funding in our budget to um, carry forward a facilitation and community engagement um, contract into the future. Um, those services have been there in place to support the Climate Council and will be broadened um, in the new round. We just closed the RFP and have selected a new contractor to work with going forward and are currently drafting that contract to advance um, not only um, facilitation services, but how to support um, frontline and impacted communities coming into the conversation through the development and engagement with community liaisons, payment for community engagement uh, to come to meetings and really thinking about how we do that um, in a broader way that helps us also inform policy development. Is that mean the EJ bill, uh, which I have concerns about because of underfunding? Yes. Um, is it been helpful to have that, helpful or unhelpful to have two parallel things, same sort of goal going on at the same time? So um, Carla, Ramonde, and I are really coordinating because I would argue we're sort of like a year ahead of where she is because yeah. she's working on her community engagement plan, standing up the council, all of that. Um, and so I, if I see this working well in the future, those relationships with frontline and impacted communities are really at the heart of what Carla's office will do and we'll be able to tap in and all work together um, so that we're not overextending or overburdening those communities to respond to a million different state things and really prioritizing that work. She is helping me, um, the community engagement coordination position, really climate justice is at the heart of so much of environmental justice, um, drafting the um, work priorities for that position and helping me hire that position. So that will really be the hub between our two offices. And so I, I think long-term, it will be really helpful to have that space and that body of work, but trying to jive when like we're trying to move really fast on climate action and she's still getting going um, just requires some yeah. sort of back looking as we go. Okay, well, I know, I think one thing is, Ms. Very Conscious, we talked about we send the blueprints out here for e and r and others to do a lot of work and i just always want to make sure that when you're receiving them and then implementing turn those into real things um, that when you need more resource you let us know because then we can go to bat for you to have that resource that's great yeah so we have two hundred thousand dollars of base funding for the contract in our climate action office budget which is for now um, sufficient for us to continue this work um i know it, i had the pleasure of meeting senator watson at one of our public engagement events for transportation but um, the gwsa has a robust public engagement requirement for rulemaking it ironically um and I, this is something we're going to talk about with the climate council this spring Public engagement is not required anywhere in the GWSA um, except around rulemaking. Um, and then at that point, it requires quite robust public engagement statewide targeted at frontline and impacted communities. But I would argue it's a little late in the process because we're required to do the rules because they were in the plan. 
So we're going to propose a more robust process for the council to consider that we actually formalize a public engagement process for any consideration of the climate action plan or addendums or components of it so that we ensure we're doing early and often engagement. But we did hold six um, events around the state focused on the rules that I spoke to earlier in the transportation space. We tried to focus them um, on the um, programs and policies needed to be in place to support all Vermonters feeling like this was a successful transformation to electrification. So rather than the details of the rules, it was sort of here are the programs and policies that exist through incentives, through infrastructure, electrification upgrades at your home. What else do, could we be doing to better support this transition? Um, and while it wasn't perfect, it was, I think, a really a good first approach to rethinking how we engage with folks and really try to have a dialogue. Um, what we need to do in the coming years through increased capacity and staff is demonstrate a systematic way of hearing from people and showing that we're adapting our approach based on what we're hearing from them. And that's something I would argue we're struggling with right now, how to be um, responsive in real time and something that we're trying to do through creative ways and public comments at climate council meetings, how we're trying to do better in having all of our task groups, which are not required to be public, public, so people can participate and comment. Um, and then going forward, um, really trying to think about how we set the stage to inform legislative action um, at, so that we can come to the legislator legislature with public input and I think we're trying to work really closely with the public service department this coming year in the service of the expectation that the renewable energy standard will be updated um, and expanded and so we're supporting um, the coordinated outreach with frontline impacted communities on renewable energy policy in the coming uh, six months um, as a component of PSD's broader public engagement that they plan to do in service of an updated renewable energy uh, policy. Or can you talk to us a little bit about it? So. That's great. Um, and yeah, and we feel like it, it's a really great model for us. We have a really great really working relationship with PSD and really can sort of be added value, I think, in that space for them. And then all of our contracts in the coming year have robust public engagement processes, which I would argue is really a, a change in approach for state government. Um, it's really not about state government building tools and then rolling them out. It's about, again, creating those tools and supporting those analyses with public engagement all along the way. And so all of our contracts um, have that built in. That's it. <laughs> Lots of information. So yeah. thanks for going with me. And I'm happy to take any questions that come up along there. Okay. Thanks very much. That was a, a lot of good information. Um, I, can, I can see and hear that you are definitely in the thick of it. You are. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, any committee questions for Ms. Lord-Georgia? Where, was where can we find the carbon budget? Oh, yeah. Um, I'd be happy to share the link with uh, okay. Jude right after this. Um, but it's on, for um, further reference, the climatechange.vermont.gov website um, on is the repository for, there's a resource tab there, as well as the climate action plan and all the appendices. So they're all there. That website is changing in the coming weeks. It really was a website built to serve the Climate Council. And we'll, we are uh, working with VEIC, uh, with VIC, sorry, VIC, <laughs> I always want to say VEIC, to update it to really make it a website in service of the Climate Action Office, but also community engagement and still um, the calendar, which people use a lot to attend meetings and things. Um, one thing is, so you sent on uh, Vermont I'm the counselor for the general assembly. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And I think probably we're, what I'd like to do is schedule time for us to uh, slow down and go to that with you. There's a lot of uh, good information and also it's interesting enough that you know when I'm reading it, there's questions. So it's good to learn more. Um, I'm really glad you read it. So thank the, you. <laughs> why don't you change uh, drmont.gov? So I didn't know that was there. Is that uh, is that where everything's going? Yes. Jim, since we have a moment, I 
and I understand if you're not able to answer this question, but uh, one of the questions that I had um, coming out of the testimony we heard from Secretary Moore was, um, I wasn't clear on how the administration or the different agencies were feeling about meeting the 2050 goals in comparison to meeting our more near term goals. And I'm wondering if your office has a perspective on that. Meaning which ones are we're working in service to meet all of the emissions reductions target goals. And so I, I have heard Secretary Moore speak in service of the 2050 reduction yes. requirements. Um, I think that um, while well, we have an eye on 2050 as the ultimate reduction requirement, um, those intermediate steps are statutorily required okay. and we appreciate that they're there for a reason and we're working to set up the policies and programs needed for them. Okay, that was, I think, my confusion as I, I wasn't sure if she was making a case that it wasn't statutorily, statutorily required. <laughs> yes, like I don't think so. I don't say that word. Yeah. Um, can you, while we have a couple of minutes, can you say something about the, the pathways analysis work so we can understand how, how we have, what the first cut at it is and what's coming that might be from? Yeah, so the pathways analysis was the modeling done um, in support of the climate action plan. So what um, were the sort of targets and policies needed to meet both all of the requirements, 2025, 2030, and 2050. Um, it's where we sort of hear those um, large ambitious numbers between now and 2030, the additional 90,000 homes weatherized, the 127,000 electric vehicles. Those were the numbers put forward in the mitigation scenario to meet the emissions reductions um, requirements in service of the 2030 um, requirement. Those um, many of, not many, I should say, but substantial policy action has been taken um, between already since that pathways analysis um, was done. Um, the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, as well as the implementation of the rules for advanced clean cars and advanced clean trucks. And so actually an important next step is updating what's the business as usual model um, that set the baseline for how far we could get with current programs and policies mm -hmm. and what the gap is that was needed to close. And we're actually doing that in, um, as a first step for the buildings and thermal analysis, um, not just in the buildings and thermal space, but comprehensively, um, including um, updating it for the Inflation Reduction Act to the best of our ability. It's obviously a very different federal funding approach than IIJA and um, ARPA, where in that we have to competitively apply for many of the programs. But um, that, as well as the um, adoption of the rules so that we can have an updated and more refined analysis of what the targets are and numbers in order to meet the emissions reduction. So we'll have that in February, which will be interesting information just to share um, in thinking about mitigation policy. Yeah, that's great. Um, the, you know, I think from, from uh, this committee's point of view, I'm thinking of uh, any of that sort of analysis that you can share with us that helps us see where does Vermont have an opportunity, for instance, to bring more federal dollars to the work that we want to undertake by behaving in a certain way in a certain time frame? Like, is it the Affordable Heat Act that we're getting going this year, next year, whatever? I, I, my sense is there's money available and we're making a transition and reducing emissions. So I'd love to see us partnering with the administration and figuring out how do we construct programs to the greatest advantage of Vermonters in running programs in a way that will either win grants or be eligible for funds? I will say that one of the um, scenarios proposed in the buildings and thermal analysis is how far um, could we go in expanding current programs to meet our emissions reductions requirements? So could you really build upon tier three programs, uh, weatherization and meet the emissions reductions or can you not do that? Um, and so really trying to look at sort of how to close the gap in the most effective way. In the, uh, I know we did a lot of work in here on weatherization lately. We need to like double, double again. We're trying to build that hockey stick curve. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there were forces out there to help us meet that, but um, my recollection was that 
even with pretty aggressive weatherization targets, we'll, we'll only make, we'll only see like 10% of the reduction we need. It's reducing a more efficient building using less fuel, and then we need on top of that just a full switch. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very, very much true. And yeah. the, I know there's um, interest in understanding order of operations and having homes weatherized first before right. fuel switched, but appreciating yes. that there's um, a need to sort of work lockstep to move both of those forward between now and 2030. Yeah. Um, so there's a, you know, I'll read a quote since we do have a little time out of the pathways analysis. And, and so it was interesting that it was in here. So one of the key findings of this analysis showed that meeting emission reduction requirements that you would say it's not only possible, but that it would be good for the state's economy. The analysis noted that in comparison to baseline or a business as usual scenario, by 2050, the central mitigation scenario modeled in LEAP, the low emissions analysis platform, um, offers 6.4 billion in net economic benefits. So that's a very encouraging big picture. Um, and what I'd love to learn more about is how do we, uh, there's an investment that goes along with realizing those savings just as we do with efficiency remote. Um, do you have more information to share that lets us see the timing of those investments and then the timeline for realizing those savings? Yeah, yes. Um, so um, there, that is a, obviously the significant capital investment is needed to realize those efficiencies, but overall the net benefit is there. Um, and that marginal of cost abatement curve that we did has the specifics on the policies and programs and sort of like when, um, how much investment is needed and when the benefit is realized. Um, the challenge with the marginal cost abatement curve is that you can't pick and choose which ones are most cost effective or which ones realize the best net benefit because all of them are needed to meet the emissions reductions requirements. Um, that said, it's still a useful analysis to look at. Um, like weatherization is an interesting one. Weatherization is really most impactful to do it now because if you do it in 15 years when people have already switched all of their appliances to electric, then you're actually not realizing a lot of benefit from that weatherization um, because the house can dump out the right. clean electricity and not really save you any emissions. So you, you want to invest in those now to realize the greatest benefit long term from those. Um, TJ Poor and I um, actually spoke about this. Maybe you saw this, but Johanna Miller had reached out to me and um, David Hill at EFG. Um, about a presentation on the pathways report and the marginal abatement cost abatement curve um, and TJ and I wanted to just reiterate that as a state product we'd be more than happy to present on that together and if that might be of interest because it is really um, deep dive into understanding how the modeling work what the limitations are of that modeling um, and what the um, benefits are is really important to be able to communicate clearly about the choices we have in front of us. Um, yeah, so uh, great. We'll, we'll follow up and schedule that more time. Right. Uh, besides, so I'm guessing it's not only the dollars, but the sequencing. Mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah, and we'd be happy to focus in on the building's thermal sector if that's of most interest with S5 on that. Yeah. Sometimes I don't look up enough to see questions from the committee. That's just plenty of email here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but, so happy to follow up with that. Uh, other, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to some of my flags that I missed before. I just might as well start. Do you have a couple? Of I do. Well, uh, so it sounds like there are a lot of great tools that are either done or in the works. Um, and so just thinking about, I mean, I know you all are, are great at um, getting out uh, information, in, in, you know, engaging the public. Uh, so, and, and that's even like a goal, right? To like uh, refine that process. But so I'm thinking about our municipalities that don't have a lot of staff, don't have a lot of capacity. Um, and particularly thinking about that um, municipal 
uh, toolkit or the, and you mentioned briefly like how, you know, there's maybe some capacity building um, could be done that either as part of that or something, but uh, wondering if you can speak to like how you're getting the word out about these tools, like the vulnerability um, assessment and, and the toolkit and, and how, how can we help municipalities with not a lot of staff um, uh, access these things? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I am Lawless, who's this, the chair of the Wheelock Select Board, um, has been a member of the Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee and is involved in both of the, tool, um, the toolkit development and the Municipal Vulnerability Index Toolkit. And she likes to remind us constantly that towns like hers only do anything if there's like funding associated with it. Like they're not going to do a climate action plan unless there's a reward at the end of yeah. like here's a million dollars to move something forward. Um, and so we've thought a lot about how to um, both develop the tools with those folks in mind um, and how to support added capacity to bring that to folks through RPCs. Um, uh, we've been talking closely with ACCD quite a bit about added capacity at RPCs specifically for climate change planning um, to support small municipalities, as well as actual leverage and funding to bring uh, folks to smaller communities. Um, and we'll be thinking a lot about that as part of the Municipal Vulnerability Index tool. There'll be a full report that reviews all 234 towns to actually specifically, wait, did I say two, I said 234 towns because that's how many actions there are in the climate action plan. Oh, so now I'm just marrying the two things. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we'll be looking, that they'll review all towns and rank, um, do some comparisons. And we'll be thinking proactively about how we support communities in particular uh, need going forward. And I suspect that'll be something um, in future years about how we bring added capacity and technical assistance to municipalities. And I really hope that will be part of Marion Wolf's job of working closely with towns and RPCs to be that um, sort of conduit to articulate what's needed and what would drive action in towns. But we, as I'm sure folks have told you in this committee, like Chris Campany, a former counselor and others, we expect an inordinate amount of action at our, the municipal level in Vermont um, and put a lot of work on small towns that don't have capacity to do that. Thanks. Uh, well, I don't want to take up. <laughs> um, uh, okay. I have another question. Yeah, Back to, yeah. All right. So um, I don't, without, uh, since we have a chance to ask about this, uh, and the kind of action plan from 2021, can you remind me, the committee, what we said about thermal at that point? Yeah, so the number one policy recommendation in that climate action plan was the development of a clean heat standard, as well as the adapt, um, adoption of weatherization at scale were the two um, complementary components. <laughs> yeah, that, and the, the, that the Climate Council put forward in that. Well, one out of two. One out of two. <laughs> yeah. About five hundred. <laughs> Pretty um, impressive. Yeah. yeah, if it was baseball, it would be uh, doing really well. Mm -hmm. The return. Sure, okay. Well, this one might be a bit of a, a tangent, but so I, I think about um, the, the sequestration potential of forests uh, and uh, but uh, thinking about plants that take up carbon trees are great uh but there are plants that are better at taking up carbon uh you know thinking about high density perennials um how is is there is there any work being done around um encouraging plants that take up lots of carbon does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah, okay. So yeah, uh, rather than just a, like conserve what we yeah, have. Or, right. So the climate change forester in FPR, uh, Ali, Dr. Ali Kasiba, she was working really closely specifically to look at 
um, closely with other states to look at forest management practices to enhance carbon sequestration and storage, obviously. And, and you know, sequestration, storage, very, you know, two different things, um, old forests, young forests, all that kind of stuff. And so she, a lot of um, materials around how we can better manage our forests to do those jobs. Um, and I would argue that you're right in thinking about crops and sequestration and storage um, across the landscape. And there isn't any direct recommendation to my knowledge in the climate action plan that sort of talks about um, thinking about the kinds of plants that we plant to take up storage. I, I think we're in a really um, amazing um, position in Vermont where we have such um, amazing natural and working lands and that first and foremost, we should be conserving and enhancing what we have as our primary strategy. Um, but there is um, a recommendation within the plan that speaks to tree planting and sort of reforestation of our um, urban and downtown area as, as a strategy. Um, but hopefully, um, we won't have to get to thinking about sort of alternative practices for taking up a lot of um, sequestration and storage because we'll do a good job of protecting what we have, but um, certainly something to think about for future iterations. Of it's just something on my radar. Yeah, it seems like it's potential. Anyway, yeah. thanks. Yeah. We can have like seaweed farms. Right? Yeah. I think seaweed is really good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right, right. <laughs> We're even feeding it to and cows. And you can feed it to the cows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, I hope that. Mm -hmm. Um, Sarah, Aye. Okay, Sarah I want to go back to something you said a few minutes ago because it was, I think you're right that uh, conservation, not using energy in the first place, is probably the path of least resistance and the biggest bang for the buck. To what extent are we out of whack with that principle? Yeah, some would argue our climate action plan is just a redirection of sort of a cleaner energy version of how we live now and didn't go far enough in acknowledging conservation first, not only of natural and working lands, but of everything. Um, and um, I know voices who have been at the table for us um, from indigenous communities and elsewhere bang that drum for us. Um, for lack of a better metaphor, often saying that first and foremost, we need to be talking about conservation of resources, including um, energy and uh, all of that as a primary objective. And we strove to, in, in the climate action plan, there is a section on personal action. And I will um, admit that was a real tension in the climate council from the onset an appreciation that the only way to meet the objectives of the GWSA is with systemic policy change from the top but an appreciation that Vermonters want to be part of the solution um, and see what their role is and have a personal stake in climate action, but how to sort of ensure that lawmakers, administration officials act and not put the burden on personal use was something that people wrestled with quite a bit. And um, I will say often feels maybe like we have failed in not doing a better job of conservation first. And that's something I think that we'll be thinking about as a communication strategy and how we talk with Vermonters. Um, but yeah, I very much agree. Uh, it's hard to go into people's houses when they heat them to 74 degrees or, you know, and then think about fuel switching. We have to think about how we change our comfort level and what we need um, as part of this plan, which is what I spoke to earlier about nothing short of a change on how we live um, as a community, as people, to be successful in climate action. There's a saying I used to hear more years ago. I was like, use it up, wear it out, make do or go without. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, an old, before, yeah. that's an old tradition mm -hmm. in Right. Yeah, long yeah. before the environmental movement. Yeah. So that, that's like yeah. Yankee frugality. That's so we get Yankee. I don't know that it. I don't That's going to be our motto, our catchphrase for the next one. Yeah. So <laughs> you're you're teeing up something. So tomorrow, uh, <laughs> we have John Erickson. We, you know, I, I had the privilege of being one when I was in grad school. His first year at UVM, taking ecological economics. Yeah. Him, so, so yeah. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> this is a new book. He's coming in tomorrow to talk to us about <laughs> that. He's a whole. Uh, Ron Nolet, the economic economist, to address just that kind of thing. So our, our planning is uh, 
teach on getting better. His, his father was the chair of the Cornell Economic Department, so a very traditional economist. He often draws this contrast between him and his father. That's really okay. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting things about the report on, on uh, energy use was that when you move from people with low incomes to the mm -hmm. next uh, quintile, you find that the next quintile substantially uh, uses more um, resources to eat with. And, uh, and you go, well, how come they use so much? Well, because being warmer is comfortable. There's heat that's being used to, you know, make make people's lives livable, and then there's heat that's being used to make people's lives more comfortable. And, and when you tax the fuel, uh, you're taxing the more comfortable, more. There are also people who use energy to make life less comfortable. I feel overheated in almost every interior space I find my place. So when they, people make places warmer than are comfortable. Well, there are those who would say that the air conditioning makes the place too damn cold. You want to open a window. You want to go grocery like, shopping in August, you better bring a sweater. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, well, any more questions for Ms. Mozorchuk? Well, thanks for knocking out of the park as usual. Very helpful. And um, I'm sure we'll stay in touch. Yes. And, uh, you know, one thing I'd like to come back to as part of AHA is the thinking about what just happened with the best clean cars. There was a very robust economic analysis that was part of that ruling. Yes. And um, one of the things I'd like to ensure, and to the extent that S5 expresses this clearly enough now, or it doesn't, is that we would ensure that we have the same kind of robust economic analysis so that when we say that we're really aiming to meet our goals in the most affordable way, that we give ourselves the best possible start down that path, knowing that there's a lot of detail to be developed in the ruling process. So I think I would, I've been saying this in a more vague way to Secretary Moore, but I'll, I'll ask you to think about it and maybe share what's going to What can we do in S5 that will ensure, um, you know, because the program will go live in 26, we have time to develop the process and um, looking for ways to improve the analysis along the way or other improvements we see as possibilities. 